Hi all and welcome back to my very first playthrough of the original Siberia, the GOG version. And we are in Barokstadt's library in the university where we are snooping around and we will of course continue to do that. But if you happen to enjoy this journey or the channel or any other thing connected to it, I would love it if you drop a sub or a like. Yes. Okay, and now uh, we did, we could talk, we can actually only talk to one of them, but we did find an um, uh, Amerson book at the end of last, and I said that we would start off by reading it, and so we shall. The Red Amerson Cuckoo, Cocculus Rosso, this subspecies of the common Cuculus canoe is endemic in the Amazon forests and is one of the region's most brightly colored species. The male's plumage is a bright vermilion, while the female's is a little more. It's kind of hard to see uh, in this text, but something neutral. Russet and neutral. Habitat and food. The red cuckoo inhabit, inhabits the more isolated and denser areas of the Amazon forest. It is reliant on the thick upper foliage of the rainforest to live its lonely existence. The explorer may nevertheless have an excellent view of the bird when the animal ventures to lower branches in search, search of forest sauvignon grapes. Oh, all right. The wild vines provide the bird with the majority of its food. The cuckoo is particularly partial to its juicy fruit. The red cuckoo may sometimes gorge itself on this fruit to the point of drunkenness, rendering it an easy prey for any jungle predator. Eat and be eaten. Such is the implacable law of nature. Reproduction. Like other species of cuckoo, the red Amazon cuckoo delegates the task of raising its young to other birds. This parasitic behavior enables the species to reproduce prolifically and with minimum effort. The female cuckoo scouts its territory on the lookout for nests under construction. She chooses the moment when its owners are absent to lay her eggs, generally in the afternoon. The host, meanwhile, will lay mainly in the morning. After laying an egg in her selected nest, the female will remove one of the host's egg and destroy it or eat it later. The cuckoo's egg generally hatches before the eggs of its adopted brothers and sisters. The cuckoo sheep will instinctively edge the other eggs from the nest. The young cuckoo grows fast. Sometimes its foster parents will perch on the back of the hungry sheep to feed it. Even if the cuckoo's egg is very different to the smaller host's eggs, it nevertheless mimics the host egg in certain ways. Not perfectly, but just enough to be accepted by most species. The future. The red cuckoo's love of the grape could sadly prove fatal for the species, species in the medium term. European settlers who have tried to cultivate the grape on the Amazonian alluvial plains have decimated the Amazon red cuckoo population. Grape produce it to protect their harvest from uh, what they would call inveterable looting have declared all-out war on the bird. It is to be feared that the cuckoo will be on the losing side. The red cuckoo reproduces relatively well in captivity and is one of the jewels in the crown of the Barockstadt University ornithological collections. However, scientists at the university have their own reservations about the species and its propensity to become practically invasive whenever conditions are favorable to it to the detriment of other uh, rarer species. Heads of the Barockstadt Aviary have therefore undertaken a policy of bird control to attempt to balance out nature's imperfections in this artificial environment. The Forest Sauvignon Grape Today it is very rare to find the Forest Sauvignon Grape in the wild. The species has been decimated by a terrible equatorial phylloxera, phylloxera epidemic. However, in Europe, successful cultivation of the plant is the pride of the Barockstadt University Botany collection and has largely contributed to the survival of the species around the world. 
Uh -huh. So, what we got from that is that the pesky birds in uh, the station can be bribed into drunken stupor by finding some delicious Sauvignon juice or grapes. Excuse me. <clears throat> can I disturb you a second? No. You could be a little bit nicer about it. Keep quiet. In case you haven't noticed, we're somewhere that requires silence and tranquility. Well, he wasn't very friendly. Then again, it is a library. Okay, so let's go in this direction then. We can go there and also there was something... Maybe it's the ladder? It was the ladder. Okay, classic click and point adventure time. Ah, well, it's the only book that is uh, upside down. The Illustrated Dictionary of Plants and Mushrooms. The Friends of Barockstadt University Naturalist Society, prefaced by Professor Cornelius Pons. Okay. Oh boy. Uh, we have a lot of more smallish text to read. The Jan Galacola. The Jan Galacola is a mushroom without stem that has a chewy texture. It is a member of the polypore family and grows exclusively on the trunks of certain trees of the Amazonian jungle. While it is edible when young, the Yangola cola has a woody texture and is insipid flavor and offers no great culinary appeal. Native Amazonian tribes, however, are very attached to the mushroom. Why they are so fond of the fungus? Why they are so fond of the fungus has taken extensive scientific research to. Uh, elucidate? Biologists have reached the conclusion that the Yangala cola contains a special substance that is unique to the mushroom. The substance significantly affects vision and enhances its acuteness enormously. Amazonian Indian hunters discovered this effect and started using it centuries ago. The Yangala cola is dried and ground to a powder and consumed before the hunt commences. Its effect is instantaneous and the penetration of the hunter's vision increases extraordinarily. The hunter is then able to aim and hit targets concealed behind thick undergrowth, even over great distances. Very cool. So we need some of that shrooms to... Uh, how can we get down? I'll try that. All right, so now we know we need grapes. We might need to talk to Professor Pons, and we also need some shroomy. Okay, I think we've actually been everywhere now. So let's go back outside and continue to the left, I think. Yes. Um, what do we have? Okay. Onwards we go. Oh, maybe this is the correct place to be. Uh, the rectors, maybe? First. Sneaky, sneaky. Nope. I think that's all we can do in here. Good day to you, gentlemen. Tell me, young lady, to what do we owe this pleasure? Please do be brief. We do not have very much time on our hands. As rectors of this university, we have serious matters to attend to, and our time is precious. 
I have heard you wish to meet the owner of the train that is currently in your station. May I know the reason for your summons? We are surprised that your train has not yet left, miss. The situation is most regrettable. The rules do clearly state that trains are meant to come and go and not remain stationary at a platform. Trains should first stop, then subsequently leave. That is the rule. We agree then, dear colleagues, that what we're dealing with is deviant behavior. This matter really is cause for concern. It's a clockwork train, you see? So it needs winding up again? Unfortunately, there is no equipment in the station to do this. A clockwork train? That's strange. How very quaint. You mean it's some sort of mechanical toy? You are causing a hindrance to us, miss. I am very hopeful that I will find what I need along the wall. The wall? Uh, miss, that really is not a suitable place for you to go. Especially for a young lady. You see, miss, we freely admit that every day we praise the existence of that particular edifice. We owe the integrity of our dear university and the fine education it provides to the wall. It protects us from harm and invasion from the unknown. May God protect us from what is beyond those ramparts, miss. Please believe me. I don't have any choice. I must continue my journey. Uh, such a decision is a correct one since it's in line with regulations. Thus, your train will indeed be able to leave. And consequently cease to obstruct our station. I haven't introduced myself. My name is Kate Walker. Walker, Walker, haven't we already had a Miss Walker? Ethnology Masters, September 1953, if my memory serves me correctly. Perfectly well, my dear colleague. But if I may be so bold, it was a Mr. Walker and not a Miss. It was Bill Walker, sat this June 68 exams. The impudent fool turned up for the oral assessment in jeans flouting strict internal regulations which explicitly state the required uniform for the occasion. Pure incitement. It was scandalous. Sadly, we have seen worse since. Young people lack all respect of traditional values. Tradition, young lady. One must always uphold tradition. Well, how could they do such a thing? Jeans? Anyhow. You see... I didn't actually intend to stop here, but the springs of my train gave up, you see? No, not really. You mean to say you're not a student? You have arrived a little late in the term, miss. Enrollment for this year has already terminated. But as rectors of this university, and therefore representatives of its highest authority, we could bend the rules a little, if you like. You don't understand. I'm a lawyer from New York. Or, rather, Valadilen, more precisely. My client wants to buy out an old mechanical toy factory, but its heir isn't actually dead and is living somewhere in Siberia. I've got to get to him to sign the sales contract. You see? Not really. This is a most peculiar tale. A kerfuffle of the highest order. We have an excellent law school, if you should ever change your mind. Why the kerfuffle? Okay, let's go with the... Can you possibly help me out here? Miss, your insistence is almost verging on indecency. We cannot constantly be at your disposal. We have many other requests to attend to. If you don't mind, could you not disturb us all the time? Thank you. That was rude. Does the name Hans Vorlberg mean anything to you by chance? Ah, one of the brightest, most idealistic intellects to have graced our university. Hans Vorlberg. I remember speaking to him once. I was still a student at the time. He just stared at me, lost in thought for a while. He scarcely ever said a word. But how can one forget him? Idealistic? I'll grant you that. But bright? Oh, don't go too far. He was completely incapable of passing any exams. All he ever did was to sit in on lessons, and not many of them, either. Paleontology, mainly. He had an unhealthy passion for mammoths, which matched the state of his intellect perfectly. That is to say, prehistoric. Prehistoric? How 
dare you. A little far-fetched, maybe. But he did have flashes of intellectual brilliance, comprehensible only to high-minded scholars who hold no score by appearances. My dear colleague, your hasty conclusions are somewhat cavalier. My assessment is wholly accurate. The boy was a little odd. You must concur if my father, who was rector of the university at the time, had not shown great indulgence towards him. Hans Vorlberg would have never attended this establishment. What about the bandstand, then? Is that the work of a deranged mind? Even after all these years, you are still jealous of it. My dear colleagues, I beseech you. Let's show some decorum. We have a visitor. Uh, what do you want with Hans Vorlberg, miss? Uh, are you a member of his family? No, no, not at all. I'm looking for him to clear up an inheritance matter. Is he still here? What? <laughs> here? At the university? <laughs> no, not at all. He left a long time ago. Yes, a very long time ago. The very year I was nominated to this position, in fact. Almost 50 years ago already. The poor soul moved on once he learned all he needed to know about mammoths. Ah, this establishment was never quite the same after his departure, it must be said. You mean to say it was never as bad? All that Oddball brought to this university was his misplaced fantasies! Gentlemen, gentlemen, let's try to retain the calm and level-headedness that befits our position. Yes, indeed, let's. Excuse me. Miss, we find ourselves terribly put out by the presence of your train in our station and by its recurrent immobility. Indeed, the situation is very regrettable. Your huge locomotive is very cumbersome. A train should first stop, then subsequently leave. That is the rule. That idea of the station aviary is really very original. It's the pride of our university. One of the specialties taught here is zoology, you see, and more particularly, ornithology. Proper study and instruction should not be limited to books. Observation of living matter is indissociable from theoretical questions. It contains some very rare specimens that have been brought back from far away exotic countries, especially for our university, by the world's most intrepid explorers. Do you remember Alexander Valembois? And his peculiar bird? Absolutely. His gift produced some very embarrassing long-term consequences. A poison chalice, indeed. It must be said, the situation could have been much worse, however. Oh, yes, it could have been terribly problematic. Okay. How about that Sauvignon? You wouldn't know if there is any forest Sauvignon here in Barakstadt, would you? Absolutely. <clears throat> when he says absolutely, he means, of course, absolutely none. What we mean, of course, is that we are absolutely positive there is no forest Sauvignon here in Barakstadt. Really? Are you sure? Because I read in a book that Barakstadt possesses a number of plants. I wouldn't mind getting a hold of some, if possible. Out of the question, miss! The assistant rector means to say that our priority is for you to remove your train from our station. Your research will have to wait until your next stop. Yes, that's right. Y your train must leave the station immediately, so please refrain from wasting our time in needless visitations. Don't forget the regulations, miss. Don't forget them. Trains should first stop, then subsequently leave. And quickly! Okay, they were definitely lying about the, the grapes. They have some, and we gotta have it. We'll talk them out of it somehow, or, you know, steal it. But first, could they give us some money? Some sailors have agreed to tow the train, but I don't have enough money to pay them. I was wondering if you could help me out. For a while. I could work for the money. Please wait, miss. We have certain confibulations to attend to. That is right. We must confibulate between ourselves. A collegiate decision must be taken. I hope that we are not indisposing you in any way. <clears throat> Why not? 
if it helps us get rid of that train. My word, that is a fine idea. What do you have in mind, gentlemen? Hmm. When you arrived here, you must have noticed a splendid bandstand which honors the main university courtyard. A unique piece of mechanical craftsmanship which no longer works, alas. Why, yes, we have very moving memories of its melodies. We're prepared to offer you a financial reward if you can set it working again. With pleasure. What do I have to do? Unfortunately, my dear, time and rust have taken their toll on this university, and our automatons no longer have a spring in their step. <laughs> you are going to have to be resourceful! To tell you the truth, there are a number of complex mechanisms here in Barakstadt, and it would appear that we have unfortunately lost their operating instructions. Your train, however, is an extremely ingenious invention, so you should be no stranger to complex mechanisms, should you? Uh, we are therefore counting on your ingenuity, miss. I hope that I can show myself worthy of your faith in me, gentlemen. Well, my dear colleagues, one more university matter nicely tied up. All right, I think we're done. Here we are, busy chat-chatting, and look at the clock. It's tea time. Already? My word, doesn't time fly by? Thank you for a charming visit, miss. And thank you, gentlemen. All right, so we uh, got some information and we also got a job, but also a guarantee. We'll get the bandstand working and they will give us sweet, sweet money. Um, I don't think we can go in either of those directions, so maybe now the time is right to head all over the universe to the right, yeah? And we can also go up there, but we'll, I think we'll save that. Yeah, this is a cool building. Okay, who is this guy? Excuse me. Sir, please, just a moment. Yes, what is it? I'm not deaf, you know. I am sorry to disturb you in your work, sir, but... This young mammoth is primigenius is barely 40,000 years old. Fantastic, wouldn't you say, miss? Uh, yes. Probably. What do you mean, probably? Uh, I don't know. You don't know? Well, you don't know, I see. What can I do for you, my dear child? All right. Let's start at the top. To tell you the truth, I don't know very much about mammoths, and I'm not here as a student. In fact, I'm a lawyer. It's all right. Nobody is perfect. All the same, the study of the Pleistocene period is fascinating. I'm sure it is, but I'm sorry to say my current mission is totally monopolizing my time. Another time, maybe. Ah, oh, that's what they all say. Anyway, let me present myself. I am Cornelius Ponce, Emeritus Professor and Lecturer at the University of Barockstadt. I'm proud to say that I'm head of the Department of Paleozoology at our university. Kate Walker, pleased to meet you. So that is Professor Ponce. We should ask him some uh, Sauvignon questions, but first, some other stuff. It wasn't really my intention to stop off here, but I'll confess, this university is really very impressive. Ah, uh, indeed. There's such a tradition of learning here. And so much knowledge, a real depth of culture, intelligence, and gray matter. I myself did my studies here and never left. Actually, I'm here because I've been summoned by the rectors of the university. Oh, I see. You must have made a mistake on your enrollment form. Uh, oh, no, no. I haven't come here to study. I have an important matter of inheritance to attend to. I have to find the heir. And you hope you will find him here? I'm not altogether sure. But you see, my train broke down coming into Barakstadt Station. 
In that case, my dear, you must come to one of my lectures. Uh, here's a question for you. Do you know what the Probosidian Order is? The probo Ah, you see. There are gaps in your knowledge that need refreshing. Well, he's kind of correct about that, I guess. I feel I've lost my way a little here. I could really do with your help. Oh, my dear child, you've chosen your moment. I absolutely must finish off my lecture for this afternoon. It's a lecture about mammoths? Oh, yes and no. More specifically, it is about their migration. Do excuse me, I need to concentrate. <sighs> to tell you the truth, I'm looking for Mr. Hans Vorlberg. He's the sole heir of a very unusual factory. My company is in charge of negotiations for the takeover of this factory. Uh, at last word, he was living in Siberia. So, as soon as my train is ready, I'll be continuing my journey eastwards. Siberia. Ah, Siberia. But what was it you said again? Said what? You mentioned a name. The person you are looking for. Vorlberg. Hans Vorlberg. Do you know him? Hans Vorlberg. How could I forget him? Such an extraordinary fellow. So inventive. We shared a passion for mammoths, you know, and we bonded over this passion. Without it, I confess, I would have had little to do with an odd, ageless retard like Hans. At the time, we were both students. Well, sort of. Put it this way. Hans had special permission to attend paleontology lectures. You see, he didn't really have the necessary qualifications. In exchange, Hans did a few odd jobs around the university. Your Hans Vorlberg sounds uncannily like the one I'm looking for. I'm not sure, my dear. Hans was above all questions of money and business. Just to imagine him running a factory, <laughs> perish the thought. Can you tell me a little bit more about him? He was always a mystery to me. He never said very much, and never quite seemed to grasp what you said to him. He expressed himself instead through his incredible mechanical contraptions. His inventions, I admit, have been much appreciated by the university. The few times we really did talk, it was about his strange interest for mammoths and a doll. Some sort of doll that obsessed him. A doll, you say? Yes. He kept talking about it. One day he described it to me. A sort of children's toy. A miniature mammoth mounted by a mount. It appears he found it in a cave not far from his home. The event all sounds very dramatic. His account was slightly confused, but it awoke a great interest in me. What do you mean? To my knowledge, there was only one tribe who made figurines featuring a mount, and that tribe is the Yukols. They live in the farthest reaches of Siberia, and for them, the dolls constituted a sacred object, illustrating one of their central legends, how such a doll made the journey from the frozen Siberian north to a cave in the French Alps is a mystery to me. Even today, it is beyond my comprehension. Have you considered that Hans Varlberg was maybe making it up? You said yourself he didn't seem to have all his mental facilities intact. No, that's impossible. Hans couldn't invent the story like that. The doll is a sacred part of the Siberia legend. He described it to me in exact detail. Siberia itself is a chimera that paleontologists of the world are very fond of pursuing. All right, and we have that doll, so maybe we should bring that to him? Um, we have quite a few more things to talk about, but I think we should... Uh, yeah, let's ask about the Sauvignon. If I were to say Forest Sauvignon to you, what would you say? Oh, let's see. Sauvignon. Sauvignon? I would say it's some kind of tropical shrub, don't you think? We are talking about the same plant, then. It is a very rare shrub with small, juicy fruits. I found a book about the Amazon, and it says that there are even Sauvignon plants growing right here in Barakstadt. You wouldn't know where, would you? Mm, Amazon Sauvignon plants here? No. No, I don't think there are any. Highly implausible, but uh, 
You should ask the station master. He is keeper of the greenhouse at our university, so he could tell you more than me. Oh, thanks very much. Okay, two reasons to go back to the, the train. Arriving in Barakstadt is an amazing experience. I've never seen such a station. Uh, you came by train? Yes, in a kind of clockwork train with a spring mechanism that winds down. Regularly. You mean you drive a train? Young ladies of today never cease to amaze me. Oh, no. I'm not the engineer. The train's engineer is actually an automaton. I am sorry, all this probably sounds very strange. A clockwork train? Driven by an automaton? I once knew a man long ago who could have invented such a train. It was he who designed the bandstand in the main square. Ah, uh, to think that he was even capable of creating such a gadget. He was astounding, a true genius. But oddly, at the same time, he was also... almost a child. It was as if his mental and physical evolution had definitively halted at the age of ten. Can you believe that? Uh, yes. I think I can believe that. At least I'm beginning to. Yeah, we all know it sounds. I'll leave you in peace. I hope I haven't disturbed you too much. Sorry? No, 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 not at all, my dear child. Yes, we still have some stuff we could ask him about, but I think we will talk to him again eventually anyway. Because I intend to bring him the toy and also talk to the station master, which we will be doing in the next part. Thank you for listening in while I talked about verse and then talked to some old birds. I hope you are enjoying this as much as I am. I would love it if you dropped a sub or a like and if I saw you again in the next part. But for now, it is time to say bye bye.